Join us as we visit the land of Gaudi and Hamon. Today we're talking about Barcelona. Welcome to Vacation Mavens, a family travel podcast with ideas for your next vacation and tips to get you out the door. Here are your hosts, Kim from Stuffed Suitcase and Tamara from We Three Travel. Hey, Kim, welcome back from California. Thank you. Yeah, I'm happy. I guess it was Kidafornia. Kidafornia, that's correct. Yeah. And I do have to say, California is a pretty great state for kids. So where you were, was it affected at all by the rains that they've been having? Yeah, so we were in Southern California, and it was funny because we locked out. We had actually really good weather most of the time we were there, uh, but everywhere we would go, people would comment and say, we've had really bad rains. We've had really <laughs> bad rains. It was the common you know, locals talk to us every time we were there. Well, we've had really bad rains, so it was kind of funny, but... Thankfully, well, I saw our some of the trip, yeah. flooding and um, things in Southern California, but then I'm planning a trip for a client that's doing a California road trip, and there's a bridge that's now going to be closed for a few months. So that whole Pacific Coast Highway, you can't do the whole thing right now. Just pretty oh, sad. Wow. For- yeah, that is yeah. sad. I hadn't even heard that. It's I love that I love drive. I want to do it again. We drove from Seattle to Southern California, but we once we hit the Bay Area, we moved over inland and just took five down to go to Disneyland but that's sad to hear that that's closed yeah you can still do uh, you know a good part of it but then like you you can't make it all the way up from like the central coast up to like Carmel or Monterey so you could like go up for a bit and then backtrack because yeah. it's hard to get around the, the mountains or you could just go up the 101 um, but really that whole Big Sur area is what's so pretty so you kind of need to I guess you're going to have to plan on doing some backtracking if people are doing it. But anyway, that was not where you were. So where were you? Well, we were in Southern California, though. So, you know, we hit, we flew in and hit San Diego. And then we kind of moved over near the Anaheim and Buena Park area. And then we hit Huntington Beach for our final day. So we did um, kind of a lot of the popular destinations that you guys have probably heard of. So we were in San Diego. So we did the San Diego Zoo and SeaWorld. And then we also, one thing that was kind of cool about San Diego, we went to a place called Belmont Park, which is, I guess, on the weekends. And in the summer, it's open. We were there on a weekday, so the rides were all closed, but it's got this really old wooden roller coaster. And so it's kind of a popular spot that's kind of an outdoor fair, and it's got an arcade inside. So we were there to play the arcade, and then we went next door to this place called Draft, which I don't know, I didn't count how many, but it's got something like... I would guess 50, 60, 70 beers on tap in the bar. So it's crazy. And it's right next door to that. So that was kind of fun. Definitely one of those spots in San Diego that people might not know about. And one of the coolest things in San Diego that I kind of noticed is the fact that we stayed at a place called the Catamaran Resort. Uh, It's a hotel and spa, but it's right on Mission Bay. And so we actually had like a Bayview room uh, that opened up straight out into the sandy beach area of the bay. And the resort itself seems kind of, it's definitely like an older property, but it, they've maintained it really well, and the groundskeeping staff takes care of it really well. And they've got gorgeous, lush uh, grounds that are just kind of really tropical and, you know, little waterfalls and pools. So there's all these ducks and just gorgeous greenery, you know, all around the buildings. You almost can't see the buildings when you're on the interior path. So it's really nice. That sounds pretty. So is it also by the beach? Like you said, Bay. Yeah. So it's on Mission Bay. So it's not on like San Diego beach, the Belmont park on the other hand, where we drove to that you can go and walk right out onto the beach that runs along the boardwalk, but the Bay is on the more interior side. So it's almost kind of picture, I guess, like a peninsula type um, layout. And so you're on the, with the catamaran resort, you're on the bay side, which, um, I think I'm guessing, um, the price point, I didn't look them up, but I, based on the fact that it is a little bit of an older property, 
I think the price point would be really nice and you get gorgeous, you know, sunrises and it's on this really popular activity path that, you know, we would open our windows in the morning and everybody's walking and running and biking by and kids are playing in the sand and the hotel puts out lounge chairs and beach umbrellas and so the guests can go sit out. And um, so it's still beautiful, even though it's a bay, uh, but you would have to drive somewhere to go to the beach. That sounds like a good tip, though. I like finding places like that that people may not know as much about. Absolutely, yeah. And it's a short, I mean, the drive over to, like, the Belmont Park area was pretty easy and quick. So it's not that hard of a thing. And like I said, you're you're probably your price point is going to be a little better where you can still feel like you have, I guess, an ocean view in a way, but you're just facing um, east instead of west. Yeah, well, to have a water view or anything, that's good. Yeah, exactly. So was, how was, yeah, oh, go ahead. sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, and there's a marina and stuff. You feel gorgeous sand. I mean, it feels good. So go ahead. Cool. So how was surfing? So, yes. Yeah, so our last day we were um, in Huntington Beach, which is a very popular beach. We've driven by there because of the fact that it's really close to Disneyland. So on some of our uh, trips to Disneyland, we've gone from Newport Beach up to Huntington Beach. So they kind of share, they basically are adjacent to each other. And Huntington Beach, we stayed at the gorgeous Hyatt Regency Huntington Beach. And it's a really nice property right on Huntington Beach. So part of, they have a partnership with this um, company called Toes on the Nose. And they're in like a little shopping district that's cute because the Hyatt Regency has kind of a little adjacent, I don't know, I guess you would call it a strip mall, but it's not that big. So it's basically like five little shops. Uh, There's like a little grocery store and then a couple of restaurants and then uh, the toes on the nose. And they do surf lessons and bike rentals and things like that and especially work well with guests that are staying at the Hyatt Regency But their surf lessons, we headed out. So we met there. They get you all suited up. That's one of the things that I love. So if you're a traveling family, you just want to try it. You just show up. They have a spot you can put your bags and everything. And they'll even help you. Like you can take your camera down to the beach if you want. And they'll try and take some pictures for you. Although the surfers are in the water with you. So they can't do that unless you have a waterproof one. But you get suited up in wetsuits and towels and everything. And they give you, they get boards and you head down to the beach. They gave us a short, so it was a one hour lesson time. And I thought, okay, it's probably going to be like 30 minutes of lesson and 30 minutes in the water. That's kind of what I was expecting. But they actually took us down there. We put the things down. They probably talked over how to stand up on the board for about 10 minutes. And then we hit the water. And so I feel like you need more preparation than that. Oh, man, yeah. (laughs) But you don't. And um, so they had us kind of just, I I guess it was really nice surf conditions at the time. They've had some, you know, some days are worse because of all the rains. They've had a few um, really tough lessons lately. And so they said the conditions were really good for trying to learn. So we, you know, they tried to help as much as possible. I swallowed quite a bit of sea water, salt water. Um, And it was a little terrifying like I'll be honest I'm terrified of sharks I hate being cold I hate cold water so for me it was a real moment of you know how travel sometimes really opens your mind to new experiences and this was oh yeah yeah so this was a situation where I was faced with this dilemma I thought honestly I thought about backing out and just saying I'm just gonna take photos from the sand you know (laughs) I really wanted to do that but my daughter mentioned to me she goes I'm kind of scared mom and I knew If I didn't show her that you need to have confidence in trying new things, like it was a moment of kind of parenting for me. So I didn't let on that I was terrified. I didn't, you know, (laughs) nothing. I've uh, encountered that many times, you know, especially with Hannah, because she is braver than me. And sometimes she knows it, you know, but I do want to, I want to show her that you should try to face things that you're afraid of, you know? And so I try it, even though sometimes I know I'm, this is going to be a one and done kind of thing, you know? Yeah. But you know, yeah, it's so much about like the message that you're sending to your kid and absolutely wanting to encourage them to, you know, try it and yeah. And then I, absolutely. And then I felt really good afterwards. I mean, it's amazing how empowered I felt and how proud of myself I was that 
I overcame those fears and gave it a shot and did the best I could. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard. I mean, it's amazing how hard of a sport that is. They go through it and, you know, this wave comes and they're like, go, go, go. And you start going, you're like, okay, I have to pull my hands back and pull my knees up. And then I need to put my foot up. And by the time you're like, okay, my foot needs to go up. You've like off balanced and you wipe out. But I really, I can't even imagine it because just like doing paddle boarding last year, I mean, I'm fine once I'm standing on the paddle board, but like getting up is hard. And I, if I was doing that on a narrower board as I'm moving, like not a chance. That's totally what it is. Yeah. I would be happy if like, I'm happy to like, um, what's it called? Like boogie board, you know, where I can be on like my stomach Mm -hmm. or something. But yeah, that to me, there's so many things that I would be terrified of, which is so funny because when I was like a teenager, I had such a crush on this surfer dude. And so <laughs> there I was, I bought like surfer stuff and posters and I was like all into that, but I never tried it. And that, that time has come and gone. Like now I think I would be terrified because I'm so <laughs> like, like you, like I'm scared of sharks, but I'm also like, I hate going underwater, yeah. like always all my life. I hate it and terrified of it. And as yeah. soon as you said, like, I swallowed a lot of seawater, I'm like, I- I'm out. That's yeah. it. It's and like I, when I did the, the fly boarding a couple years ago down in Alabama. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That was, I was under the water so much and I'm like, I'm done. I'm out of here. Yeah. Yeah. That, so that was hard, but it, I would say, I will say that, you know, we were always touching the sand, like you could always stand up. So they never took us out that deep which was surprising that we actually had waves enough to ride. So um, I did stand up like two times where I actually got my feet on the board. But then, of course, as I was like raising my body up, then I would wipe out and start falling. But at least I got my feet on the board. And um, Lucy Lucy was the same same way. I thought she would be a lot better because she's kind of a gymnast and stuff. But I think it's just different. Like if you're – I think also she's a bit like me that – if you in your mind, you know, you start thinking through this, like move my hands here, move my knee, you know, it's just yes. that if you don't have that natural rhythm to your body, even with her being a gymnast, her balance is good. I think just getting those movements down, it didn't help. But the other girl who we were there with, I was with a girl I met on the trip. Her name was Scarlett and her daughter, Sierra, was just a natural. It was crazy. And wow. her mom was just like, wow, <laughs> you know. See, the bad thing about that is then your kids are like wanting to go back and do it again and again. <laughs> yeah. And that's Lizzie. Liz, it was Lizzie's favorite thing. She wants to go again. To She wanted to stay an extra day just to go surfing again. So so next time, at least you can be like, well, you know, at this time, I really want to get pictures of you. Yeah. 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 So I went in a little early so I could take some photos and stuff. But yeah, she she would have stayed out there for another two hours. Well, do you know that while you were away, we had our one year anniversary? We did. That's exciting. I, it's hard. To- I even saw like on Facebook, like my little memories popped up of like when we were like in the, what's it called on iTunes? The um, oh. new and noteworthy and stuff. You yeah. know, I'm like, oh, yeah, I can't believe it's been a year already. I cannot believe it's been a year. It's, that's awesome. Yeah. I we- think most. Most podcasts make it, what, like seven episodes or something like that? Wow. Yeah. So we're on the 47, 48. Yeah, something close to there. That's amazing. I, I, th- I hope everyone's enjoying it. And I think based on our numbers, you know, we're getting new listeners and people are enjoying it. So, yeah, I, I like what we're doing. It's fun to have a different platform to talk about travel since we write about it so much on our blog. It's kind of fun to get a chat with you every week. I know. So I think we should do something special. Sounds good. What should we do? Um, I was thinking maybe we should hear from our listeners. Yeah. An anniversary episode of maybe they want to reach out and tell us some of their favorite, favorite moments or favorite tips or ask us for more information about something. Yeah, I feel like all of, you know, we always have um, an agenda, right? We always have something that we're going to talk about a topic, but maybe we could just answer questions, whether it's about us, you know, I don't know, something about us, our lives, our, our blogs, the podcast, how we got started, how we met, um, I don't know, like whatever, we're about destinations, you know, if people are planning summer trips and they want some tips and ideas, but just, yeah, like whatever people want to ask us, I think, um, if they can send it in, we'll just do kind of a freestyle, uh, episode where we can just answer questions. Yeah. Yeah. I think that sounds fun. 
I mean, hopefully you guys know by now. We always are telling you where we're at. So I think they could just leave a comment on an episode or reach out on our Facebook page. That's probably an easy way, facebook.com slash vacationmavens. Yep, or you can send an email to podcast at vacationmavens.com. That'd be really easy. <laughs> That's and there's, one. yeah, there's a lot of ways. If you go to vacationmavens.com, you can see all of the social media platforms that we're on. If you look at any of the episode show notes, it also has a phone number where you can call and leave a voicemail. Um, maybe if we get a few voicemails, we can even play them on the show. So as long as you can keep it kind of short. So yeah, anyway, reach out. Like we want to do something to celebrate and we want to involve you guys because it's the only reason that we're still doing this a year later. Yeah. I'd love to. I'm excited. I hope that we have a lot of people that write in because I would love to hear lots of questions and things that they want to hear about. Yeah, me too. But for now, we're going to talk about Barcelona. Yes. Or I guess Barcelona is kind of like they they do that like teach with the C instead of like C. Yeah. Ah, Yeah. See, I'm learning, learning stuff already. Great. Well, let's talk to to Nancy. (laughs) Let's talk to Nancy. So we're here today with Nancy Dom Daly, and she is originally from Maryland, but has lived in Spain since 1994. And she led educational trips for young people throughout Spain and Portugal for eight years before launching her own company, Enchanting Barcelona Tours, in 2011. And she specializes in kid-focused tours and experiences. So welcome, Nancy. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. I should also mention that Nancy and I met um, actually this past fall because we both planned trips for families for Chow Bambino and we were on a trip to Italy together. So we had to have lots of fun experiences, right? Yes, like driving through Chianti (laughs) at high speeds. Yes, uh, lots of funny stories. So it was really nice to spend time with Nancy. And obviously she doesn't, she know no one knows uh, Barcelona better. So I really thought she'd be the perfect one to talk to about Barcelona. Definitely. Thanks so much. I'm excited to start talking to you. Do you have a little insight into kind of when you moved over there from Maryland? And then what made you want to start up a tour company for Barcelona? Gosh, well, I actually went to study abroad in London, and I finished my degree there, and one of my best friends from college was Spanish, and she invited me to um, come to Madrid for the summer, and that was 1994, and I did, and then that summer turned into a very, very long summer, and I'm still here. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I um I was in Madrid for five years before I came up to Barcelona, and I was in Barcelona, and uh, all this time I was doing educational tours, leading educational groups throughout the country, but I got a bit tired of living on the road, and I decided to make Barcelona my home base, and uh, I really felt like there were so many guides out there that are fantastic, but kind of overlooking Uh, what I think is the most important element, which is kids. And I really wanted to do tours that included kids and really got them engaged and excited uh, about what they were seeing. That's awesome. Do you see a lot more families traveling now than you used to? Definitely. Definitely. In the last 10 years, you really notice that um, there are a lot of families traveling um, with and without grandparents. So yeah, definitely. Yeah. So I have to ask you too, do you have a preference between Barcelona and Madrid then? Do you prefer Barcelona? Um, I think they're both wonderful, but Barcelona is more my style. Um, Yeah. It's a bit smaller. um, It's got a great mixture of restaurants and outdoor life because you're right on the beach. um, And it's fantastic, I think, as well for visitors because they can kind of combine the two. And have some beach time and some great culture time and eat well. I think when we went over a few years ago, Hannah and I both really loved Barcelona. Of the bigger cities that we visited were our favorites. Um, but Glenn really liked Madrid. But, you know, he he's definitely a city guy. You know, he lived in New York City and it, it has more of that vibe to me. You know, more of the uh, energetic, busy city where people are working and living. And Barcelona, to me, felt a little more like 
Paris, like with wider avenues and just like a, I don't know, just more relaxed, but I love the historic um, quarters too. So I, I just loved it. Yeah, I think um, Madrid, you can really compare to New York City and and Barcelona is more more San Francisco or Boston or Paris. Mm-hmm. Yeah, nice. yeah. Yeah, I, I, we haven't been and I would love to go. I, I think it just, I'm very excited. I, I see photos and I always dream of getting to Spain, but it's good to see the difference here from you kind of both on the Madrid versus the Barcelona, because it's hard to know that when you're planning a vacation, you don't always know what to expect. But recently, both my girls have really gotten into foreign language. And um, I'm wondering, of course, since we're in the States, most of the Spanish they're learning is, you know, Latin American based Spanish, right? So how do you think that affects if kids travel over there? Can they, is the Spanish extremely different or can you get around with it? (laughs) You can definitely get around with it. And um, it's kind of like the difference between British English and American English. Yeah. Um, So everyone can understand each other. And the Spaniards are, they're like the Italians, you know, they're so family oriented and they absolutely adore it when people try to speak their language. So it, you know, your, your, your girls could try and they start speaking and, uh, the locals will be absolutely enamored. Oh, so definitely. Yeah. I remember the first time Hannah tried to order in Spanish and we had practiced, like she had been taking Spanish, but she hadn't learned that much, I will say, practical Spanish. Um, we listened to this great podcast called Coffee Break Spanish and oh. we learned like all of oh, all of the awesome. stuff that you need for traveling. And it was such, we would listen to it like on the way to and from school in the few months and weeks before our trip. And so the first time she ordered on her own, like the smile, like she was just so proud. I was so happy for her. That's cool it's to know a, it's, about. Yeah, I, I, like to, I like to hear about things like that. This podcast, I think um, that could be fantastic to recommend to families because when kids get here and they're able to do something in Spanish, all that time in the classroom, it suddenly all comes together and it makes sense. Yeah, and so great. it's a great moment. Yeah. So for families that are planning a trip to Barcelona, how many days do you think they need to spend in the city? It, three to four days if you're combining Barcelona with another uh, big stop on your trip. But, you know, I've had families that have spent seven days here um, and and been absolutely fine and had plenty to do. So you – I think it's like almost any city. You, you could spend uh, a lifetime and still not see everything. But three to four days is a, is a good amount of time. If they did extend, like say they have one week and you wanted to pair Barcelona with something else, like what would you do? And then if you had two, how would you, what would you recommend to them? I think a really nice combination is Barcelona with the Costa Brava. So the Costa Brava is the coast that's north of Barcelona, starts about an hour north of Barcelona. That's a nice combination, those two. And then if you had longer, I would pair Barcelona with either the northern part of the country, which is San Sebastian, Bibao with the big Guggenheim Museum, or then go down towards the south, Seville, Granada, Cordoba, that sort of yeah. area. It's it's hard. I know from experience, we had two weeks in Spain and we hit uh, like five different places, but it, you know, it's hard to see. It's a big country and there's so many great, great things to see. So I was just talking to someone yesterday and they said, you know, should we go in a week? I'm like, no, no, wait until you have two weeks. I mean, unless you just want to do Barcelona and one other thing, you know, but if you want to really exactly. feel like you've seen Spain, like you need, you need two weeks. So. So layout wise, how big is it? What would you compare it to in the States? Would it be like if you're driving from Barcelona to the south, like to Seville or Barcelona to Madrid or what I'm trying to picture in U.S. terms, like what would that be between driving around or I just I can't even picture the size of Spain compared to. It's it's hard to, isn't it? Because we're used to such big, big spaces in in the U.S. Um, You can actually take Spain and put it inside of Texas. So it's a little bit smaller than Texas. Okay. So if anyone's listening to this and you're from Texas, you're going to know that when someone says to you that they're going to drive, um, you know, from Dallas to Houston, you just laugh. 
right? Because the distances are so great or so much greater than um, you can imagine, which is why high-speed trains are the way to go once you're here in Spain. Yeah, and, and they're really easy. I I know when we were in Madrid, we did some day trips to Segovia and um, Toledo, and it was like a half hour on the high-speed train, super easy. Yeah. Are there it, any, other, great. any other tips for best ways to get around while you're traveling and touring? Well, I think high-speed train is um, fantastic when you're going between cities. Once you're in cities or you're in places, I think, obviously, walking, that's something that you have to prepare yourself for just like any European city because so many of the historic districts of cities in Spain, Barcelona, Madrid, Seville, Valencia, they're pedestrianized. So be prepared to walk, but also I think it's great to bring scooters for kids because they are big pedestrianized areas. Little legs get tired, but if they have scooters, it makes it all that much more fun. So. That's such a cute idea. It's a good tip. And you can fold them down, yeah, and you just check it on like you do a stroller right at the door of the airplane. Hmm. Yeah, good really tip. cute. Yeah. So what are some of the must-do attractions for families if they're visiting Barcelona? Wow. Um, I think the, the must-see has to be um, the Sagrada Familia, the big almost finished uh, basilica that was designed by Gaudi. He was a very clever man, and the inside of it is unlike any other church that people would have been into, because normally when you say church in Europe, people think Gothic and they think dark. Um, exactly. And not so exciting. <laughs> yeah, This is the opposite, and he actually designed it to be like a forest inside. And so that's a really uh, fun must-see. I think, for kids. Other must-sees, the medieval quarter, the Gothic quarter, because it's not like anything else we have in in the U.S. Yeah. So I think those those are definitely two of the kind of must-see. One of the big food markets as well, um, because we have 39 fresh food markets in Barcelona. Every neighborhood has one. And it's such a great feeling, not only the the, the food that you're seeing, but the people, it's a great people watching place. And I, I recommend trying to get something to eat in the markets as well. So you can sit down and really experience it. I didn't realize there were that many because, I mean, the La Bocaria is like the the famous one that everyone says to go to. So I didn't realize there were so many others to choose from, too. That's right. Yeah. Um, the Bocaria kind of overshadows the rest of them. But there are quite a, a lot of other ones. And some of the smaller ones are even more fun because the Bocaria, because it's so famous, can get quite crowded. So, What about the park? Of course, I can never pronounce it, but was it Guell? Park Well. Yeah. Park Well is also very interesting. And I love um, showing that park with kids because... He used um, recy a lot of recycled materials. This was a park that was going to be a housing community that was designed by Antonio Gaudi. He used a lot of recycled materials, and he also made it self-sustainable for water usage, which 100 years ago was way ahead of its time, um, and things were still trying to implement. And the views over Barcelona from up there are fantastic. Yeah, and it's it's so cool. It just I think you know one thing everyone knows about uh, Barcelona is just the Gaudi architecture and just so many of these fantastical like you know just interesting bizarre <laughs> buildings, but just are mm -hmm. so cool to look at. And I know Hannah, the Sagrada Familia was exactly what you said. It was so unlike any other church I've ever been into in Europe. I couldn't believe when we stepped inside, like the light and it was just, it's fabulous. And for months afterwards, she would write about it in her writing journal for school. Like it just made such a, a huge impression on her. Really. I can't, I, I still can't get over it. It's just such a fascinating place. I think it does make a, a big impression on children, and and children absorb so much information as well. Sometimes um, they remember more than we do, as a matter of fact. So yeah, I know that for a fact because she will <laughs> she will bring facts back to me, and I'm like, oh yeah, that that sounds familiar. <laughs> that sounds about right. Yes. <laughs> so if you needed a break from you know seeing the the churches and you know, museums or things like that. What what else can kids do to get away and 
get a little exercise or kind of have a break from the city? Well, with three miles of beachfront, we have a great area to rent bikes and, and ride the boardwalk. That's so much fun. Parks. We have loads of parks throughout the city. The Citadelia Park, which is close to the Triumphal Arch, that whole area there is an area where the families of Barcelona go with their kids after school or at the weekend. So that's fun. You can also rent a a four-seater kind of bike, which you can drive around the park, which is also uh, a lot of fun, if not tricky to coordinate uh, the two peddlers. Um, So those, I think, are, are a couple of places. And then also Barcelona has a fantastic zoo, which is in the park, and Europe's oldest amusement park, which is set up on the hill at the back of the city. And that's also a nice, fun thing to do in the evenings. Yeah, just, um, and you can get up there with public transportation. That sounds really nice. So I'm just trying to picture out, picture kind of the layout of the city and talking about all the different markets. It sounds like, you know, of course, it's pretty spread out and with the beach. So is there any like part of the city you think that families should stay in? Or do you have any favorite hotels for families or anything thinking about that pedestrian lifestyle stuff? Mm. I think um, for families with small kids, so sort of under 10, I tend to recommend that they stay in the area that's known as the Achampla. That's the extension area. And that's the area where we have the nice wide avenues. Um, And that's because the medieval quarter, the Gothic quarter, you're staying in buildings that were originally built in the 1200s. It's a little bit harder to get around with little legs because it is such a big pedestrianized area. You're going to have to walk to the edge of that area if you wanted to get a taxi or if you wanted to hop on the metro, etc. So I think they're kind of two different areas. I adore the Majestic Residence, which is um, part of the Majestic Hotel. It's in a great part of town. You can walk to everything from there. And it was a building that was actually built with apartments that were going to be sold to families and or to individuals. And they couldn't make a go of selling them. So the Majestic Hotel actually bought the building. And so you have these really nice big apartments with lots of light and, you know, all the amenities that you would want. That's my favorite um, location for people to stay. So you have like the best of both worlds with like hotel amenities, but apartment space and apartment living. Yeah, that's nice. Just I, I go ahead. Just to get an idea of, you know, like budget wise, what would you say Mm -hmm. that runs? I'm just, I'm not, I'm not even, sorry, I'm so out of there, but what, what is the exchange rate like right now for um, the U.S. dollar? Do you know? And then what would a room set up like that cost? Do you have any idea? I don't know the exchange rate off the top of my head, but it's been really good recently. So it's about one to one. Yeah, it's really close. It's really close. And it looks like the dollar might even actually gain some traction, which is great for families visiting Europe because then things will be a little less expensive. In high season, so in the peak times when we're all able to travel with school breaks, etc., for a two bedroom apartment at the Majestic Residence, you're looking at somewhere between 350 to 450 euros a night. There are apartments that are definitely big enough where if you have three kids, they can also set up uh, a bed in the living room. And the living room is so big, it, you hardly even notice the bed is there, frankly. So um, that's kind of price wise what you're looking at. Cool. One of the things that I realized after I traveled there, you know, I had this plan of, oh, we're going to go for tapas every night and there's all these great places to go. But then I realized after walking, as you said, all day and then seeing things like our legs were tired. And what I didn't realize is that, you know, tapas bars are usually standing up at a little high tops or at the bar or something like that. So many times we then wanted to find a place that we could sit down and just relax over a meal. So do you have any um, restaurants that you would recommend for families? Absolutely. One is called uh, El Nacional. So the national in Spanish. 
not too far from the majestic residence, so in the, um, in the Paseo de Gracia. That's four restaurants in this converted space, and it's it's beautiful. So you can have tapas, you can have fish, you can have grilled things, or you can have. There's also um, an Italian place because we have a big Italian influence cuisine wise uh, here in Barcelona. Um, my favorite place in the old town is a place that's called Lucia, L-U-Z-I-A. Um, that's a great place um, just off Las Ramblas, which that area on Las Ramblas can get quite touristy as far as restaurants are concerned. But if you just get off of it a little bit, you'll find great places. Or um, Santa Marta, which is right down on the beach, and it's a very non-touristy um, place that serves beautiful salads, um, fish, uh, homemade pizzas, etc. Nice. I must, I, we went down to that beach area, um, Mm -hmm. one day and it was definitely hard to pick because whenever you see all these restaurants, like right along that boardwalk, you know, some of them are going to be really touristy, you know, so we definitely appreciate the local recommendations there. Absolutely. It's one of our favorite places, actually. We go there quite often just living here in Barcelona. So cool. Do you have any tips on when the best time is for people visiting? I know you mentioned, uh, when you guys are all touring with your kids on your off season. So are there any tips for the best time to visit? June is a great month. Easter week is also a fantastic time or spring break, depending on what your, your school system has. I try to uh, veer people away from the mid July to mid August time, which tends to be the hottest time. But I think the most important thing is to plan your day and live like the locals do. So plan to be out of the heat of the day between 1 o'clock and 4 o'clock, which is when it's the hottest. Go to the beach, go to the pool, have some downtime uh, in the apartment or the hotel. Because it stays light here in the summertime until almost uh, past 10 o'clock, so 10, 15, we still have light. So you have a nice long day to enjoy, um, but don't don't waste your energy being out in the in the hottest part of it because you won't make it to see the sunset. <laughs> and when I have a question because when we were there, it was in June, and I was surprised. Mm-hmm. It, Barcelona was definitely a lot cooler than everywhere else in Spain, which was nice. Um, so it, I don't know if that's regular, and also. I also found that people, um, shops and things didn't close down for the siesta the way that um, they did in the south of Spain, at least. So is that kind of um, the norm? It is, absolutely. Um, Barcelona now, um, it's very rare that you have shops that close midday for the siesta. Um, And we always have, and this is the wonderful thing about Barcelona's weather, we have a little bit of a microclimate, so we always have that sea breeze, and that that really helps to keep things nice and cool. And we're oftentimes a lot cooler than places that uh, that are nearby. Well, that's good to know. So, uh, one of the questions that we like to ask is, what is the best place to take a family photo to remember the trip? Mm. Wow, um, I think. In front of one of the Gaudi houses, because he has two apartment buildings that were designed, one of them was designed to look like a dragon, uh, which is very fun. That's a great place to take a family photograph. In the park, in front of the wonderful big fountain there with the uh, Greek goddess Sibeles, the Greek goddess of Arc, beautiful place um, to take a photograph, a family photograph to remember Barcelona. I know we tried to take one on the, what is it, the the chameleon bench or the you know, the, you know his mosaic, um, is it a chameleon? It is, yeah, it's a chameleon. It's a reptile. We'll go yeah. with reptile. Yeah. It could be anything. <laughs> but uh, trying to get that without a million other people in the picture is very challenging. It's hard, yeah. In in Parkwell, you've got uh, the chameleon or the reptile there and it's a famous place that's hard to get a family photograph but upstairs in that same park or further up the hill on one of the wavy colorful mosaic park benches that's a possibility yeah 
I think we have one there, at least of Glenn and Hannah. We rarely have one of the three of us. Got to got to change that. Yeah. <laughs> ask your guide. Ask ask, ask strangers. Yeah. Talking about guides, I just want to really quickly ask: Are there any? specific attractions or things to do that you would recommend hiring a tour or hiring a tour guide? How does that work? Because I know when I was in Israel, I was, it was kind of my first exposure to a lot of families hiring like a personal guide for the day or their whole trip. And so how does that work? Do you think in Barcelona or Spain on what would you recommend? I always recommend that families uh, book a half-day orientation tour that includes the one highlight monument of the city. Because then you get you're you're oriented, you know what's what, you know where you want to go back to, and you're you're not so you're not flying blind, so to speak. And the obviously the 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 beautiful big monument we have here is Gaudi Sagrada Familia. And I think that it's fun to do with a guide. You have to choose your guides because not all guides are kid-focused or family-friendly. Uh, for example, we do scavenger hunts with uh, with families um, in the in the church. So it's fun because it gets kids looking at things and really understanding what the architect meant to do, you know, what his idea was. Yeah, I would say when we went there, we just did the audio tour and I'm sure we did not get nearly as much out of it. I mean, it was interesting, but there's just something too about like you're separately listening to something like you're not really hearing things at the same time or commenting together. So we've been doing more and more uh, guided tours in cities and we really, if you can splurge for them, it's so worth it. You get so much more out of it. It's just a better experience. I love the right. also the idea of the familiarization because if you're right. in a pedestrian city or you're going to try and, like you said so well, if you want to live like a local to really experience the city, I love that idea. I mean, that's I hadn't really put that together, but that's a great tip. And, and I, I say to families, when there are places um, like one of the Gaudi houses called Casa Badio, the one that's designed to look like a dragon – I will not guide families inside there because they have such a wonderful audiovisual guide. They actually give you a mini iPad and it's so enticing and kids absolutely love it. You, you swing it around and you can see what the room looked like when the family lived there with the furniture in it. And, you know, a lamp becomes a swimming sea turtle, um, so you can understand Gaudi's inspiration for things. And if there are alternatives, I'll definitely recommend those to families because sometimes with all the technology that we have nowadays, they can do a better job. They can bring it more to life than what a guide could do. Yeah. Well, don't you also, you do some interesting guides. You you do some interesting tours, like bike tours and things too, right? So you're kind That's of right. combining activity with with learning too. Absolutely. Activity with learning, I think, is a great way. Um, Segway tours or even um, one of our best experiences that every family has loved and, and many have said it was the highlight of their entire trip was actually our market to table cooking experience. So they meet the chef in the market, in the Bocaria. They decide what they're going to cook that night, you know, first course, second course, dessert, buy the ingredients and then they go back to his home, which is up in the hills of the city, overlooking the rest of the city, and they cook there. Um, and it's such a fantastic experience. Everyone has loved that. And everyone gets a job, so everyone uh, is busy preparing things. Yeah. I'm ready to book a trip now. That sounds fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Come <Yeah>. on over. <laughs> So uh, all this has been great, but we're going to wrap up, I guess, with our last question that we ask all of our guests, and that is, what do you like to wear when you travel? I um, I tend to wear black because it's easy and you can combine it with everything. I tend to go for lighter colors, obviously, in the summertime. But one thing that I will not travel without are my camper shoes. Camper is a Spanish brand. You can now get them in the U.S. as well. 
Very good quality shoes, lightweight, and so comfortable. You could walk for miles. Yeah. Oh, that's a great tip. We always like comfortable shoe tips. Oh, <laughs> it's gosh, It's an important yes. part of traveling, especially in you're walking around Europe. Very much. It's huge. It's huge, yeah. So if people want to learn more about your tours or about getting your help for planning a trip to Barcelona or to Spain, where can they find you? They can find me at EnchantingBarcelonaTours.com. Perfect. And do you have any social media profiles too? Absolutely. We are on Instagram and we are on Facebook, Enchanting Barcelona. Great. Well, now everyone, that's a great way too to get to know maybe what you might want to do in the city mm-hmm. is by following your Instagram and kind of seeing like, oh, I would like to do that. So and that's also a good get a way. visual of some of this crazy chameleon talk you guys are talking yeah. about. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Dragons and chameleons. It's like, wow. <laughs> It's a fun place. (laughs) Well, thank you so much for your time, um, especially since I know you're it's later in the day for you than it is for us. So thank you so much for taking the time to tell us about your home city. You are very welcome. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for asking me. And um, I hope you guys have a great rest of the day. Thank you, Nancy. It was great chatting with you. Same here, Kim. Take care now. Bye. So we are back with our tip of the week. And since we're talking about Barcelona, it really reminds me of our first trip to Europe with Hannah was to Spain and Barcelona was our first city. And it was really exciting for us because it was the first time that we were going out of the country where another language was going to be predominant. And I really wanted her to get the most of the experience. I wanted her to understand what we were seeing and be involved in that process. And it actually, it worked out really well because it really stuck with her. It made a huge impact. Um, But some of the things that we did, which, you know, are tips that you can incorporate into a trip to Spain or really any kind of big trip. Um, First of all, we wanted to learn a little bit of language. And so while we use Duolingo a lot now, we used Coffee Break Spanish podcast, which was really great because it was really targeted towards travelers. And so you could just listen to the episodes about restaurants and greetings and your things like that. So you would know then how to order in a restaurant. And it was, it was great. You know, when we were there, Hannah, um, ordered on her own in Spanish, which is, I was so proud of her and she was so proud of herself. Uh, we also, if you are going to Spain, one thing that we found really fun was we watched, uh, there's a PBS special, which you can probably get on like from the library or I don't know, Netflix or something called on the road. And it's with Mario Batali and Gwyneth Paltrow and they travel and, and someone else too. I forget who they travel around Spain and they're they're eating, you know, they're basically showcasing all the different foods of Spain. And I just thought that was really good because it made Hannah and I both more interested in trying foods that we may have shied away from otherwise, if we hadn't seen it. But when you see it and the people are talking about it and like, oh, that's so delicious. And it makes you like, wow, I think I want to try that when I'm there. Whereas if you just said, do you want to have, you know, I don't know, sardines, I'd be like, no, thank you. Mm So anyway, those were a couple of tips. Um, We also always read some books. I know we read Don Quixote before we went to Spain, um, which is not Barcelona specific. But if you do some searches, you can usually find some, you know, books, uh, whether it's picture books, chapter books, you know, different uh, really novels, things of all different genres um, that are based in an area and just kind of gives them a sense of place and maybe they'll start to recognize some things once they're there. So those are some of my tips for preparing for a trip, um, not just to Barcelona, but kind of any big trip to a new destination. Yeah. I love visiting our local library before big trips because it's amazing. Like you start to see the different medias that are out there, like you said, like a video or whatever. I mean, we would, I watched Rick Steves quite a bit because he's a Seattle guy, but um, yeah, definitely some good tips there. Well, I just wanted to remind everyone again that we are celebrating our one year anniversary. So thank you so much for tuning in and making this whole show possible. And we are hoping to hear from you guys, lots and lots of you guys about your questions that you might have for us, whether it's about the podcast, whether it's about our blogs, whether it's about travel tips or destinations that you're thinking about, kind of shoot us a note, an email, 
and ask us what you're dying to know because we would love to chat with you. Even if you need help with a part of your trip that you can't figure out, you know, both Tamara and I are pretty good at travel planning and research. So um, you can always shoot us one of those too. Anything you want to know, we'd love to hear from you guys. Oh, and you know what I forgot that we forgot to do? We forgot to announce our winner. Exactly. (laughs) Congratulations, Eliza, for winning a copy of my book, Wanderlust. I'm so excited to get that sent out and hear how you use it and how you like it. So thanks everyone who entered and thanks again for joining along on this adventure that Tamara and I are doing here at Vacation Mavens. Yes. Thank you so, so much. And thank you for sharing with your friends and your communities as well. Anyone that's interested in learning more about family travel or just fun destinations. So don't forget to leave us your questions and hopefully we'll feature them on our next episode and we will chat with you then. Talk to you later. Thank you.